Hello biologists, we're going to pick up where we left off and in our discussion um, and experimentation of why don't oil and water mix. We left off talking about the polarity of different substances and looking at how a variety of different substances combined. So we mixed water with hexane and a variety of other substances and found that water mixes well with itself, but doesn't mix particularly well with hexane. And the rest of those combinations can be found in a document I linked uh, to the video in the description. So we made some conclusions based on our results about how nonpolar and polar substances behave when they're mixed together. We mixed polar with polar and we mixed nonpolar with nonpolar and then we mixed polar with nonpolar. So our question right now is how do forces between molecules affect their solubility? We remember we were talking about solubility at the beginning where we were talking about how um, a piece of candy dissolved in water, uh, in both hot water and cold water and how that hot and cold water might have been different. Think about what types of forces are responsible for interactions between polar and nonpolar molecules and how these forces affect solubility. So let's look at some forces. Here are two nonpolar molecules and they come apart pretty easily. This little spring here kind of represents how hard you have to pull to um, separate molecules. Here are a couple of other nonpolar molecules. Here are a couple polar molecules. And notice how far that string that spring has to stretch before they come apart. I have to yank it almost all the way across the page versus if I do it here, I just pull a little bit and boop, they come right apart. So the, the length of that spring is representing how hard you have to pull. So you can experiment with that as well and get some ideas about how um, the polarity of a molecule represents, uh, affects how it interacts with another molecule and how hard they are to pull apart. So we need to make a drawing now. Draw a model to show how polar substances and water interact at the molecular level to explain your observations. So let's see if I can get a bigger water molecule here. I wonder if I can make that bigger. Ooh, I can. Look at that. So I'm gonna draw water here I'm going to put a negative right here to represent the negative dipole on water and put a positive here to represent the positive dipole water. And then I'm going to draw HBr. HBr stands for hydrogen bromine. And that's a very polar substance because bromine's very, very good, like oxygen on hanging on to its electron. Hydrogen's not so good. Um, it just kind of most of the time gives up its electron to bromine. And so I'm going to draw hydrogen bromine here. Here's the hydrogen, which will be positive in hydrogen bromine. I'll draw a ball and stick model just like I have for water. And then I'll draw the bromine, which that atom is going to be a little bit bigger than hydrogen. Let me move that over. See if we can fill that with a color. So on my bromine, I'm going to draw positive over here and negative over here. And you can notice here, um, that the positive is lining up with the negative here and the positive is lining up with the negative here. And that positive and negative creates some stickiness. 
Um, just like this model of water molecules that has little magnets drilled into it, you can see how it kind of sticks to each other. That's to represent how water behaves um, and it kind of hangs on to each other. Obviously water doesn't have little magnets in it, nor are the, the water molecules this big. They're so tiny you can't even see them with a light microscope. Um, but to represent them so we can easily discuss them, um, I've made some water molecules that are larger and the dipoles aren't exactly like magnets, but this is a good approximation of how water behaves. And hydrogen bromide is gonna work the same way. It's gonna has little, it's very polar, so it's just like um, the little magnets in my models here. I'm done drawing in here. So I'm gonna save. You can make a similar drawing. Now we're gonna draw a model to show how nonpolar substances and water interact. You can use some of what I've um, drawn here in the polar model. Remember, nonpolar is not charged. So you can draw um, a water molecule and a non-charged, non-polar water molecule and demonstrate how they interact. Let's go to screen seven here. We're gonna construct a scientific explanation to explain why polar and non-polar substances have different boiling points. So if you consider that polar water is very sticky and you kind of have to use a lot of energy in this case to boil a lot of heat energy to pull those molecules apart. Nonpolar molecules behave differently. They're not as sticky and it's easier to get them apart. So uh, we might need to use less heat energy to get non-sticky molecules to uh, pull apart. And boiling, of, of course, is turning a liquid into a gas. So we're trying to pull the molecules apart. In a liquid, the molecules are all together, but in a gas, they're much, much further apart and they don't interact in the same way. This would be sort of a representation of water as a gas. So let's look at our model here and let's hit start. And you can see water starting to just kind of, this polar substance, we don't know exactly what it is. Um, it's grabbing onto each other, it's a liquid, it's still moving, but it's pretty, you can see it's kind of sticking to itself, much like water would. Water uh, is cohesive, it beads up on substance, uh, things like car hoods or rain gear or plastic tarps outside when it rains. Let's see how that stickiness changes as we add heat energy here. You can see the temperature go up over here some of those molecules are um, freeing themselves from kind of the giant glob. And I would say we're pretty close to boiling here. We're getting closer and closer. I'd say that's boiling. They're all bouncing around in uh, the equal way. They're not kind of stuck to the bottom here. And so our boiling point here is right over 230 degrees. Let's see what happens if we use a nonpolar substance. So let's reset this. Remember our boiling point here was over 250 degrees. Let's reset this and this time use a nonpolar substance and heat it up. It starts moving, it's still pretty stuck together. Oh, there's already molecules coming off, um, becoming a gas here. Let's heat it up a little bit more. It's almost boiling. There's still some molecules kind of gathered down here. So let's just add a little bit more heat energy until they're evenly distributed in the box. There we go. We're at about 150 degrees. Instead of 230, we're at 150. And we're assuming that these um, molecules have similar molecular weights or even the same in our simulation here. So this is nonpolar. Let's just see if we can jump over to polar here. If we heat up a polar, it takes a lot more heat energy to get it to boil, to get all those molecules separated out in the air as a gas. 
That's the definition of boiling, is turning a liquid into a gas. So we have to construct a scientific explanation here. We have to make a claim. We have to provide some evidence. And then we have to explain why our evidence supports our claim. So our claim has to answer the question, why polar and nonpolar substances have different boiling points? Well, our claim is polar and nonpolar substances have different boiling points because of their electronegative interactions. In other words, are they the in electronegativity is are they polar, are they plus and minus, or are they nonpolar neutral? What's our evidence here? Remember the two different boiling points? If you don't, you can experiment and find them out again. And then why does that boiling point evidence support our claim? I'm going to let you finish this one. So for number eight, or for page eight here, we're going to take a snapshot of a situation where interactions between molecules are strong, weak, and one is strong and one, some of the molecules are strong and some are weak. We want to explore how does changing polarity affect solubility. Um, so we're going to see how well molecules stick together and how they interact when they have different polarities. So we're going to start out here um, we'll keep them both nonpolar. We'll show the shading just for a moment here to show that they're both nonpolar. We're going to show the interactions between the atoms, and we're going to start here. You can see the interactions between the atoms are pretty strong, but then they mix together and they have about the same interactions with each other that they do with uh, the purple ones have the same interactions with green as they do with purple. We'll fast forward and see if that continues to happen. Yep, there's no clumps forming. They're kind of all evenly distributed. So it looks like they're kind of mixing pretty well. I'm going to stop that. So I could take a picture right here where the interactions are pretty weak. This would be a good picture to take for weak, weak interactions where they're both nonpolar. I'm going to reset this and make one very polar We'll make green very polar, and we'll make, keep the other one nonpolar. And I'll just show the chart shading. So this is nonpolar, and this is polar. So purple is nonpolar, green is polar, and we'll start and see how they interact. Oops, I'm going to turn off fast forward here. So green seems to be kind of sticking to itself, and purple seems to be kind of hanging out with itself. So we could stop this like right here and kind of show that green is with green and purple is with purple. This is a good example of a situation where interactions between molecules are pretty strong. Um, we could circle this part to show that the, um, that the polar green molecules are hanging out together pretty well. So let's take a snapshot of a situation where interactions between some molecules are strong and some are weak. Let's start here. Now let's start it up again. These, these purple molecules, these green molecules are all kind of in a glob by themselves. And the purple is just 
kind of hanging out. It's kind of spread out. So these interactions look pretty strong, and these purple interactions look fairly weak. Our job in number 19 is to write a scientific explanation, a claim, about what kinds of substances will dissolve together. We had a lot of evidence on page four when we mixed everything together, and we're gonna use evidence from our simulation as well to build that claim. Um, in which different substances were mixed to observe dissolving patterns and reasoning about molecular interactions. So how do polar and nonpolar interact when we just tried to dissolve one and the other? Remember, this is water and hexane. Hexane is the clear stuff on top. Water is the stuff dyed blue on the bottom. Here's water mixed with water. It's all just blue. Here's water mixed with alcohol that I dyed red so you could see the alcohol. The hexane's on top, that's the clear stuff on top, and the, the alcohol is the stuff on the bottom. And I could shake this tube all day, but at, after a few minutes, it would look like this again. So use that to build your claim about how polar and nonpolar substances mix or dissolve in each other. Remember you wanna form the you want to use the form claim, then list your evidence, and then list your, and your evidence can come from the lab or the simulation or both, and your reasoning is explaining why the evidence supports your claim. All right, we will go to the next page here. Page nine, we need to construct a series of bar graphs to explain the energy change during the process of mixing as shown in our simulation. We're gonna to try to mix oil and water here in the simulation. Think about what kinds of interactions are responsible for the observed behavior of molecules. So let's mix up oil and water and then let's stop it shaking and see what happens. The potential energy goes down as water sticks to itself. Um, the potential energy is going down. Whenever you separate two magnets, you create some, some pull between the magnets. I can kind of feel these two magnets embedded in our, my water molecules pulling on each other. So if I separate these molecules, there's some potential energy. They, they wanna stick together, so there's some electromagnetic force pulling them together. If I separate them, there's potential energy. If I let them move together, that's kinetic energy. So that might help um, explain your graphs. Uh, your graph should look something like this. We can draw a couple straight lines. The bottom can be time. And the side here can be potential energy. Turn that sideways and move it over. And so we want a series of bar graphs here so I can just use the rectangle tool to draw some, some bars and color them in as we go along here. So uh, the potential energy uh, starts low and then as they're shaken, it gets higher because we're pulling those molecules away from each other. We're giving them some potential energy because the electromagnetic force wants to move them back in, wants to change into kinetic energy. Well, it doesn't want to, it's not a person, but it has a tendency to pull those uh, water molecules back together. And then as it pulls the water molecules back together, the potential energy uh, goes down again. So we can label this part here we 
can label that mixing and you can label the other two parts. So you can explain what's going on here in this graph and of course make your own graph. Um, what's going on with potential energy over time as you mix and that you let things separate. So you should have before mixing, during mixing, and after mixing. You should type an explanation. I didn't, so you could. You get to predict if separation, like you observed in this simulation, would happen with other uh, combinations of polar and nonpolar liquids. You can use the evidence from the lab to support your prediction. Um, we're going to revise our molecular level model of interactions between molecules right after water and oil are shaken and two minutes later. So before they're shaken, Water's hanging out with water. It's hanging out with water. All the water is kind of on its own. While it's shaken, water is mixed up with oil, and I'll Pick a nonpolar molecule here to represent oil. All the oil's hanging out by itself before it's shaken. While it's shaken, the oil and water are mixed. And then, so we'll label this before shaking. We'll label this after shaking. or actually we'll label it during shaking. And then you get to draw two minutes after shaking. And then we know that this is negative, oops, this is positive, this is negative. There's a positive here on the hydrogen, there's a negative here on the oxygen, and there's lots of positive and negative interactions going on with water. There's some kind of little interactions going on with water and oil. Um, there can be uh, an induced dipole on oil. Because water is pulling on it, all their electrons kind of move over to one side, but it's not a very strong attraction. And then you can draw what's happening two minutes after shaking. So, and of course you need to do the homework. Um, you can download this Google Doc that's in the thing or you can look in um, Schoology. All right, this is the next thing that we'll do. Um, that will be my next video. Thanks everybody.